Wow. What the hell? So, unless you've been living on Mars, you've probably seen that some madnesses have occurred. $68.7 billion. $68.7 billion. That's how much Microsoft have just paid to acquire Activision and everything that falls under that umbrella. 68.7, that's incomprehensible amounts of money. 68.7 billion. As you can tell, what shocked me the most, even though there are a lot of things that have shocked me about this acquisition, the sheer amount of money that's exchanging hands here is insane. That's the most shocking thing of all of this for me. I mean, firstly, who's valuing these companies? Like, who is it that is that has valued Activision at being worth $68.7 billion? Like, I'm not saying that Activision aren't worth that because obviously they are the developers and publishers of the world's biggest selling gaming franchise in Call of Duty. And they're also the owners of Blizzard who own and create the world's most famous MMORPG. So I'm not saying that they're not worth that amount of money, but I'm just saying that it's completely caught me by surprise. I had no idea that that was the kind of money that we would be talking about for an acquisition of Activision. I just would not have guessed that much money, would you? But the other thing that I'm really surprised about with this is I'm surprised that Microsoft would be willing to pay that much money for Activision. Like, obviously, I know Microsoft are one of a small handful of companies within the entertainment industry that can afford to pay that much for an acquisition. But I'm just surprised by it. It's the statement of fucking statements saying, look, we're the richest company in the gaming space. We have the deepest pockets. And if we have to, we're willing to buy out every single third party company in order to squeeze out any competition the competition seemingly being sony who of course own playstation it's fucking nuts i mean where does it end microsoft are worth like 2.2 trillion dollars and sony are worth like 136 billion dollars and that's the whole of sony not just playstation microsoft's clear financial commitment to xbox changes everything like if they're willing to spend $70 billion acquiring Activision, what's to say that they wouldn't be willing to spend $150 billion to acquire Sony themselves? Now, do I think that's going to happen? No, of course not. But I'm just trying to paint a picture of the world that we live in at the moment, a world where Xbox and their deep pockets have become the playground bullies of the gaming world and they're stealing Sony's lunch money. Needless to say, this is the biggest acquisition in gaming history and by ridiculous margins as well. It's a record that was set just two weeks ago when Take-Two bought Zynga for $12 billion. If you don't know who Zynga are, they're a hugely lucrative company in the mobile gaming space. Anyway, then Microsoft swing in and purchase Activision for $68.7 billion. How many times am I gonna have to repeat that number? And before I move on from the money side of it, let's not forget that Activision have come under fire recently, particularly in the Blizzard portion of Activision for just some terrible working environments including sexual harassment allegations and other misconducts as well as just a general frat boy attitude within the workplace um, which has apparently been brewing for a number of years now and that hasn't done Activision any favours in terms of reputation in the public eye and it's fair to say that that's probably significantly impacted the overall value of the company and that's likely to have brought the price down at least somewhat significantly meaning that the 68.7 billion dollar price tag was basically bought in the january sales discounted which is just mind-blowing i'd love to see an actual breakdown of why this company are worth that much money anyway what does it mean for the playing field of gaming how does it affect the future and what does it tell us about where the games industry is heading well the short answer is i don't have a fucking scooby but the whole thing does raise some interesting topics that i'm keen to get into so let's So first, let's take a look at what Xbox have actually bought themselves here, at least in the way of gaming. So they posted out this, which shows off some of the more obvious franchises that they've acquired. Overwatch is a big one for me. Whether you're into Overwatch or not, it's undeniably one of the biggest and most popular hero shooters out there. Let's not forget this game came out in 2016, so nearly six years ago. It's clearly a game that's standing the test of time, even if its player base has waned a little bit since the media problems surrounding Blizzard. Diablo and Starcraft are on there. Candy Crush, which may seem like a 
an odd thing to put front and centre, but Candy Crush generates an absolute fortune in the mobile gaming market. Then the real big two, which are Call of Duty and World of Warcraft. I mean, Call of Duty really needs no explaining. This is one of those games that transcends even gamers themselves. As in, even people who don't play games play Call of Duty. Its popularity is immensely widespreading and just dominates the home console market. Then, of course, World of Warcraft. It's the world's most famous MMORPG. Even though in recent years its player base has fallen behind Final Fantasy XIV, World of Warcraft still boasts an impressive 4.74 million subscribers. That's 4.74 million people paying £10 a month to play this game. I'm not even going to attempt to do the quick maths on this, but that means that this game's turning over like £500 million per year. Just that game alone. And below you can see that these studios have also been acquired as part of the deal, and there's even more studios that come as part of this deal that for some reason haven't been added to this list. One of those studios being Vicarious Visions. And these studios aren't small time either, there's some huge games developed by these studios. But the ones I want to talk about mainly are Toys for Bob and Vicarious Visions. Because this one really, really blows my mind. So Crash Bandicoot, the literal poster boy for PlayStation back in the day, and Spyro the Dragon. Two characters so synonymous with PlayStation that I just cannot come to terms with the fact that they are now Xbox characters. Crash Bandicoot and Spyro the Dragon are now owned by Xbox. Another big one that's not really mentioned here is that Activision are the developers and publishers of the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater series. This is a big get, in my opinion. You know, with the acquisition of Bethesda, they were kind of making a statement of intent regarding big market-leading single-player campaign games and RPGs, turning Fallout, Elder Scrolls, and Doom into Xbox first-party franchises, essentially playing the long con on Sony, where they've just bought up a whole chunk of that third-party market, a market that Sony partially rely on to keep the PlayStation a must-buy products. But even with Bethesda, Xbox were kind of lacking in their commitment to first party double A titles. But with this acquisition, Xbox are really paving their way to the top of that pile by essentially squeezing the market from top to bottom and forcing the hand of video game lovers. I mean, I'm not gonna be missing out on the new Tony Hawk's games or Spyro games or Crash games. I need them. I need to play those games. And I'm sure many other people will feel the same way. And so if I need to play them, and in order to do so, I need an Xbox, then, well, you can see where I'm going with this. So with that, the next big question on everyone lips is exclusivity. Are these games going to be exclusive to Xbox? Now, back when they acquired Bethesda in 2020, I perhaps foolishly put out a video saying that I thought that Xbox couldn't afford to take the hit on making games like Elder Scrolls and Fallout exclusive to Xbox consoles and PC. And at the time, you know, the gaming landscape was quite different. I know it's only like a year and a few months ago, but it was before the release of the PS5 and the Series X. So going on the sales of the Xbox One versus the PS4, we were looking at about 30 million units sold for the Xbox One compared to about 120 million sold for the PS4. So my argument was why would they maximize their sales at sort of the 30 million mark when they could maximize it at 150 million in total if they included both consoles in the sales. But you know, a lot has changed since then and hindsight is a wonderful thing. And I wanted to hold on to the belief that that would be the case, but Phil Spencer basically waited till the second that the ink was dry on the contract to basically say, no, if you wanna play these games, you're gonna to have to play them on an Xbox system or Xbox Game Pass. So yeah, dreams shot dead. So yeah, whilst Phil and the gang are taking a conservative approach to addressing the exclusivity questions at the moment, I think this is just because they're still in the process of completing this acquisition. And because of the size of it, we're looking at 2023 before Activision is officially handed over to Microsoft. And I expect when that does happen, Phil Spencer will be doing very much the same thing of saying, look, if you wanna play Call of Duty, if you wanna play Xbox, Tony Hawk, Crash Bandicoot, Spyro, whatever it may be, then you're going to need to have an Xbox or a PC or a device that supports Xbox Game Pass. And this is the next point that I really want to get into. I think what's really interesting about this acquisition and the general direction of moves that Microsoft are making in the gaming world is that it's kind of becoming more clear with every acquisition they make where this is all heading and what their long-term goals are. I mean, until now, it's always been about the console. Then in the last decade, it became about the consoles and the PC. And now with the PS5 and the Series X, we're seeing the first acknowledgement that the world is moving towards a digital 
digital future that relies a lot less on the physical sale of games. And I don't know whether it's the most fucking genius foresight in video game history, or if they just got lucky that things are kind of moving this way. But if you look at Xbox and what they can offer you now and going forward, it's not about the console anymore. It's all about Xbox Game Pass. That's the key, the key to all of this. And that's where we're heading. For the first time, we're seeing that the hardware is not the main selling point of this company. It's the service, the Xbox Game Pass service. And right now, there's only one company doing it at this level. PlayStation Now have tried it, Google Stadia have tried it, others have tried it, but they're all fucking miles off. Miles and miles off what Xbox Game Pass offers you. And think about it like this, Netflix, Amazon Prime Video, and Disney Plus, all three of those are at war with each other over the TV and movie streaming market, right? Each have their own selling points and exclusives or originals as they call them. Now, does Netflix concern itself with what device it's been watched on? Do Netflix make their own TVs that only Netflix can be played on? Do they fuck? They're only interested in putting that service in front of as many people as they possibly can. Now, granted, you don't need much processing power in order to stream a TV show from a device, but with every year that passes, technological advances are widening the playing field for devices that can play video games, especially over the cloud. And with Xbox launching xCloud, which is included as part of Game Pass, that now allows you to stream games from a server on devices that don't have the processing power to actually run the games native. And that is exactly where I believe Microsoft's business plan is taking them. The Xbox console is more like an optional extra, but what they really want your investment in is Xbox Game Pass, because as they swallow up more of the gaming sphere, they have more and more leverage. More and more leverage to convince other companies to allow Xbox Game Pass on their devices. We've seen Game Pass move from console to PC, we've seen it move to Android devices, and we're currently in the process of seeing it be moved to Apple devices. So what's the next logical step? Imagine being able to use Xbox Game Pass on your Nintendo Switch. And so really, it can go one of two ways. The more likely of the two is that Sony hit back with their own answer to Game Pass, which they already look to be gearing up to do. And I'm gonna talk more about that in another video. But now that Microsoft have dealt their hand in terms of financial commitment to Xbox, going toe to toe with them might not be a sustainable approach for Sony. I mean, like we said earlier, Microsoft have very deep pockets and if Xbox continue to just buy up third party devs, publishers and studios, they could very well back Sony into a corner. A corner where Xbox have the power to say, look, we don't mind people playing Elder Scrolls on PlayStation consoles. We don't mind your console owners playing Call of Duty, but only on Xbox Game Pass. It sounds absurd to think about now, but it could be a very real future where Sony have no choice but to allow Xbox Game Pass onto PlayStation consoles. And do I like this trajectory that we're on? No, not really. It's capitalism at its finest. But it's happened to the music industry when the big fish ate all the little fish. It happened to the world of movie and cinema. And now that video games have surpassed both those markets in terms of monetary value, the same will and is already happening to the world of gaming. <sighs> That's enough waffle for today. As always, if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like on it. If you're new here, please consider subscribing. And I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>